Hi, I'm Chris McCreary and I'm the founder and director of the Northern Ireland Science Festival and you're very welcome to this year's digital version of the programme. We're really thrilled this year to be announcing a new partnership with National Geographic Society and the NI Science Festival uh, for a new Explorer series which will see four explorers from across the world talk about their inspiring research and their careers to date. Tonight we welcome Kikani Katija uh, to the festival and she's going to be in conversation with YouTube presenter and, and science broadcaster Greg Foote. If you like what you see, please make sure to hit like and subscribe and follow us for more info at nisciencefestival.com. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the fourth and final conversation as part of the National Geographic Explorer Series for Northern Ireland Science Festival. The NI Science Festival and National Geographic have teamed up and we are bringing you four fantastic conversations with four prominent explorers um, who have been sharing their inspiring adventures, research and stories with me. My name is Greg Foote. I'm a science presenter and producer making shows on TV and radio and YouTube and a couple of podcasts as well. Uh, and it's I've just really enjoyed just getting to sit down and have these one-on-one -on -one chats with these brilliant National Geographic explorers. Um, I started this series chatting with marine biologist and ecologist Dr Lucy Hawkes um, and we talked about how she tracks the animals that she calls the uh, the animal athletes of the world. Uh, then I spoke to natural history photographer and research scientist Jeff Kirby and heard about how drones are kind of getting loaded up with the latest tech uh, to tell really engaging stories. Yesterday, I caught up with TV presenter and wildlife filmmaker Malaika Vaz, um, who told me about the films that she's been making to highlight the coexistence between animals, wildlife and communities and telling those stories. Uh, and today I get to talk to a bioengineer, a bioengineer with an ocean focus, uh, Dr. Kakani Katija. Uh, hello, Kakani. Hi, Greg. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing this. Uh, I'm sad it's the last session, but I'm glad that we get a, a good old block of time to have a, a, a nice little chat about your research. And I know it crosses over with, a, with an adventure that I have been on in the past, so I'm looking forward to this. The way that this works is I'm going to pass it straight over to you, and then you just have 10, 15 minutes to tell us about uh, your work or, or a part of your work, and then we'll regroup and I'll ask a bunch of questions, if that's good with you. Fantastic. Let's do this. All right. Over to you. Yeah, this is just um, kind of a quick uh, series of slides that, um, you know, very roughly share what I work on and why. Um, so, you know, thanks for the opportunity to, to share with you all, you know, what, what I think about and delve into almost every day. Um, it's an absolute honor and privilege to be able to share with you how, you know, I feel like I'm continuing to pursue a childhood dream of mine um, every day, but in a very different place. Um, and when I say that, what does that mean? Um, it's because I actually got my start in aerospace engineering. And let me move advance. And although I'll be talking about the deep sea today, I really got my start by being inspired by space. And I grew up wanting to be an astronaut. Um, and to be honest, I, I still do want to be an astronaut. And I have submitted my application to the astronaut pool a, a few months ago. Um, and COVID has kind of delayed that process. But um, my, my entire life, I've been enamored by the search for life, right? And what we could learn from that life once we've been able to find it. And to me, right, astronauts are the ones doing that vital and important work in space. And I knew deep down that I wanted to do that which is why I began my academic career and, and did um, both undergraduate and graduate studies in aeronautics and astronautics. Um, but then I kind of went through this transition. You know, at some point in graduate school, I stopped looking for life in space and instead started looking at life in the ocean. And this video that you're seeing is not an, actually a star field. Uh, this is what the ocean looks like at 500 meters deep in Monterey Bay. And so these quote unquote stars you see, right, are actually particles or detritus and waste and dead plants and animals and carbon, which are food for most of the biomass in the ocean. And while we've been unable to find life so far in the outer planets, the oceans are just teeming with life that we don't know very much about. And so that's really my journey to how and why I'm doing the work I'm doing now. And so you might be asking, how do we collect that kind of footage that I just showed you of 
um, the deep sea. And that was actually uh, in Monterey Bay at about 400 meters deep. And the ocean is many miles deep in places and people simply cannot dive deep enough to get there. It takes a lot of technology and robots like this one, like the one you see I'm standing in front of, um, it's called the uh, Doc Ricketts. It's a remotely operated vehicle that the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute operates. And I'm a principal engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI. And vehicles and platforms like this one are really important to me and my research. Um, remotely operated vehicles are rare, rated to operate at depths up to 4,000 meters. And they have a suite of cameras and instruments and tools that enable observations, like you know the ones you see on the front of the vehicle. And for example, we've developed an imaging instrument that uses a laser for illumination and allows us to peer inside of animals and other novel structures in the deep sea for the first time. And so we can use these robots plus this instrumentation and my team will then develop instrumentation that allows us to see rare animals in completely new ways. And we wanna do this because we want to understand how they survive and apply this understanding to bio-inspired engineering design. And so one of the very first animals we've studied using this kind of robotic platform, as well as the instrumentation that we've developed is the giant larvation. And these are a group of animals that's remained largely a mystery for scientists. And giant larvations uh, can be seen here. So the animal, the larvation, looks like a tadpole. Um, it's the animal that's kind of in the center of all of this structure around it. Um, and then this next clip, you'll see that this animal, is, it's actually beating its tail. So that's what's moving. And then everything around it is a structure that it lives inside that's made out of mucus that the animal secretes from cells lining its head. So how does an animal do something like this? Um, how is it able to build something out of mucus? And really, what is the point of creating such an elaborate structure if you're an animal that might only be 10 centimeters long, but your entire structure around you is at least a meter across, right? So how, why, what are they doing? And then also to point out that these structures that the animals live inside are filtration structures. These are structures that allow the animal to pump fluid and water around, around the animal into this structure. And it plays an important role in filtering or removing particles and food from the water around it. And all these particles wind up going into the mouth of the animal so that it can eat. So how does this process work? And so that's really where we began our um, investigations. And the way this happens is that you, you go out to sea on a research vessel and then uh, connected to the research vessel, right, is that robot, the remotely operated vehicle. And if you're diving a vehicle and controlling it down to where these animals are, that's roughly 400 meters deep. And this is an environment, right, that's really, really different from what's going on at the surface. So the ROV pilots, the people operating the vehicle, are having to constantly talk with the ship's crew and captain to ensure that this vehicle can remain on an animal that's hundreds of meters deep and away from the research vessel, right? Because that's where everybody is controlling the vehicle. And then once that happens, the pilots then are positioning a very large robot on an animal that's approximately, right, 10 centimeters long or two centimeters wide and using a laser sheet, you know, this laser illumination that we've developed that's about a millimeter thick. So it's incredible about what these, um, you know, together, the pilots, the ship's crew, our researchers are able to do together to get this data that I'm about to show you. Um, so before I play this, this, all right, keep in mind what, what all it took to get here to this one point. We've got a vehicle that's several tons in size. It's down to several hundred meters. You've got a laser sheet that's about a millimeter thick that has to intersect an animal that's about two centimeters wide. And everything that you see here is, think of it like an X-ray. So we're seeing just a cross section 
inside that animal, as well as its mucus house. And the head and the tail are indicated there, but there's also the filter, right? It's an outline of the filter that the animal is inside. And as I press play, what you'll see are there's these flickering, right? These lights. And those are actually particles um, and particles that are flickering when they hit the laser light. And then the movement of those particles we actually use as a proxy um, or an approximate um, method for an understanding how water is moving in and around this animal. So we can use that particle movement as a proxy for fluid motion and then directly estimate how much water are these animals processing? How much water are these animals filtering as they are feeding? And what we've learned through this process um, is that if we looked at older literature and other estimates that researchers put together, they estimate that these animals are probably filtering on the order of 10 liters per hour. But what we instead found was something much, much larger than that. In fact, on the order of 40 liters per hour, and in some cases up to 80 liters of, of water per hour that these animals are processing and filtering. And so we've scaled this up actually, and individuals in Monterey Bay together could filter 500 Olympic sized swimming pools per hour or take less than two weeks to filter their preferred habitat in Monterey Bay. And so these animals that are so small, they're filtering so much water, but it comes back to this question, how do they do it? I mean, how is that mucus structure shaped to filter all of this material for the animal to eat? And interestingly, we can use the same instrument and instead scan using that instrument to provide us with some clues. And so what you're seeing is a laser scan of the animal inside of its mucus house using the same instrument. The difference is the video I showed you before is that the, the robot and the animal are relatively stationary. In this case, the ROV pilots are moving the vehicle so that we can scan the animal inside of its mucus house. And much like an MRI or a CT scan, we can take that information and put it all together to create three-dimensional reconstructions like this one, where not only do you get this beautiful exterior view of what is going on, you can also get an unprecedented interior view, like what is going on? <laughs> you know, there's all of these chambers, these finger-like chambers that you see inside the central one, and they all join at one location. Um, at a kind of straw-like structure in the mouth of the animal. And so when you see this data, right, um, and this is data that we only just published this last year, how on earth, again, is an animal who doesn't have any arms or other appendages, just a head and a tail, able to blow up like a balloon, a structure that has so much complexity like this? I still don't have the answers. It's so exciting because we have these kinds of tools and we can start asking these kinds of questions. And one day we can come up with answers to those questions. And so this is just an example of what we've been able to do with one instrument or one development that we've been working on in the lab. And there's so many things that I'm looking forward to uh, in the future because of some really great work that my lab, along with a number of collaborators have been working on. For instance, the idea that we could potentially release robots into the ocean to look for life that either we'd love to study or life we've never seen before. And so we've been developing with a number of other researchers, the Mesobot that is designed specifically for this purpose of investigating the ocean interior, where these animals might be living. And what you're seeing is a, a, a demonstration of this robot autonomously tracking and moving with that white object that's in our test tank. And we've been able to demonstrate these algorithms of vehicle tracking over a period of time for over five hours on a single animal so far. And what we're trying to do is get to 24 hours, multiple days, a week, so we can answer questions about behavior. What are these animals doing in their natural environment? And really what we want to get to, and this is something that we've been heavily involved with in the past year, 
is this question of, can we on the fly discover and study life in the ocean? Um, and using machine learning and deep learning tools and data that we've collected over the years, can we have autonomous underwater vehicles persistently looking for life where we can both learn about animals we know and discover animals we have yet to see? And so I'm very excited about the possibility of this working. And I think it can have significant impact on how we can increase access to the ocean and some of the most undiscovered and unexplored places on our planet. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions, but really um, what will we learn from life in the deep sea? And I'm really excited because I think we'll, we'll start to learn a lot more from it thanks to these tools and others that are on the way. Um, plenty of people to thank <laughs> about this work. <laughs> can't, can't take them out of the equation for sure. Um, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That was mega interesting. And I'm so glad that you introduced us to the, uh, the larvations. Um, I was reading that, yes, you published in nature quite recently and then it got picked up. I think you had an article in the New York times, um, CBS covered it, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, were they called snot palaces or snot structures or something? It's such a good word, a good term to describe them. But yes, uh, snot palaces have stuck when we're talking about a descriptor for these mucus houses. So you kind of spoke about, um, you introduced that term bio-inspiration, right? And I know that um, you head up the bio-inspiration uh, lab. And the whole idea of bio-inspiration is, is discovering stuff in nature and then using that to inspire our own engineering uh, and development. So would the larvation with the nature of that huge filtration system, do you think that will lend itself to us mimicking it? I think that's what um, a number of people have reached out to me about, uh, right? These, these structures, at least the way they're built, um, we're, we're still trying to piece together or understand how that process works. But what we do know is that some of these larvations have the ability to filter out things as small as viruses. Um, and do you know a wide range of filtration, not just really small sizes, but also larger sizes. And so when we're thinking about filtration mechanisms or filtration systems that we use, you know, that breadth of filtration capacity, that's really difficult to do. We haven't really been able to figure out how to do that. Um, and then there's other researchers have done work that show that these um, structures can, can actually be self-cleaning um, that particles that will stick on the mucus can actually be expelled from the mucus and then resuspended and then continue moving their way towards the animal's mouth. So understanding those processes definitely are, you know, will give us a, a sense of how we might want to change the way we engineer things uh, and apply it to that technology. Can you give us some examples um, of biomimicry or bio-inspiration that, that people watching can kind of be like, oh, that was inspired by the way that the animals were doing it or, or whatever? Yeah, my, my favorite example is actually Velcro. Um, so Velcro, right, is, is from, it was designed from a, a burr seed uh, by looking really closely at the materials and what, what they look like and how they attach to objects like someone's dog. And so that's kind of the process we're starting with, you know, this experience of being stuck on a burr to something that can then be, you know, uh, reverse engineered, built, uh, as well as just manufactured at just a large, such a large scale, um, like what we see with Velcro. Yeah, that's, that's a classic a, example. That is a, that is a great one. Yeah. And as I said, you're the head of the bioinspiration lab. Um, but if I have a look at your CV, it's okay. So 2011, you're a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Um, I've now got you working with the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, California Institute of Technology. You're a principal engineer and principal investigator at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and the Bioinspiration Lab. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> They're just titles. We really get the chance to do some of this wonderful stuff that I was able to share with you earlier. I guess um, it shows the nature of the cross collaboration, but also the um, this wonderful kind of cross section of the technology with the exploration uh, and the science kind of all coming together in one. 
I mean, I should, I should say that the, when you're doing work in a, a place that we work in, um, you know, one of the least explored places on our planet, which is the ocean's midwaters, um, you could almost come up on any animal and it is either not known to science or not well known to science. And it's for that reason, you know, every time we build a new system, a new way to observe something, we know we're going to learn something new. And I also work extremely closely with biologists, geologists, you know, people who just know the science so well, know what our gaps are, because one of the worst things you want to do as an engineer or as a technologist is to come into a field, develop something without truly understanding the needs of the community. Um, and so I, you know, as an engineer, my number one priority is to understand what the needs are, right? What are the big science questions so that I can build a, something that can address those? Um, so without that interaction, you know, you, you're really not solving a problem. If I was to push you a bit further on that and say, you know, I, I, I rattled off all those titles that you have and, um, you know, all the different areas that you work in, what is at the core of everything you do? What is, what is it that motivates these various projects? The, the core is to discover life, really. Um, the Bioinspiration Lab, the number one activity we do is develop technologies that enable us to understand and study life in this region. Um, but when, I, when I start out talking about you know, aerospace engineering or, you know, Star Trek. I didn't mention Star Trek, funnily enough, but really like when we think about the original Star Trek, that that crew would go, like their job was to go into outer space and find communities, find life, interact with it, understand it. And to me, like that's such a noble, a noble uh, undertaking. And we're, we're essentially trying to do that in the ocean. It's not only noble, it's also super exciting. Like, I love that you, you know, said that you as a kid, you know, you wanted to be an astronaut. You went into aeronautics and air, astronautics, and then you kind of switched it and rather than went going up, you went down. Um, <laughs> I got lost. You, are, you know, what you are exactly doing now is going out there and finding life. And the reality is when you go to the deep ocean, there is a lot of life that we don't know. Um, I got this amazing opportunity a couple of years ago to dive uh went to about a thousand foot so about 230 meters in a submersible uh in person in the Sargasso Sea just off the coast of Bermuda nice. so I got to travel through that uh, marine snow that you showed us and and I was speaking with the researchers and, and they were like yeah we'll probably probably find a handful of new species just this week but like we won't know about it for a while I mean it's it's incredible and, and for me I feel like the the thing is with the, the ocean, it harbors so much life and it's, it's life that we can connect to. Uh, you know, like I, I give my, my friends who are still in the aerospace industry a really hard time. Like, you know, how's that search for life going? Um, and you know, I'm just, I'm just, I, you know, I just give people a hard time, but, but it's, it's really this recognition that, you know, the life that's in the ocean, that like, that is an easy connection for us to make. And so my lab is essentially involved in just trying to bring that life, you know, back to society, back to the general public so they can see and appreciate, you know, the, the incredible beings that, you know, are in this environment or in this place. And also appreciate the environment because the ocean is, you know, it's, it's one of the lungs of the planet uh, in terms Absolutely. of oxygen production and you know, source of the most, you know, most important source of primary protein for a lot of the, a lot of the population of the planet. So, you know, it's such an important ecosystem. Um, I would love to know more about the tech. And I was reading how we could kind of split it into two parts, uh, taking the lab out into the ocean uh, and bringing the ocean into the lab. So which one do you want to start with? Uh, we can start with the former if you want. Okay, so um, taking the lab into the ocean, which I guess was the ROVs, the remotely operated vehicles that you were you were telling me about. But can you nerd out a little bit more about some of the um, some of the tech and the imaging? Oh man, I can. Um, so so really, the the at least for me, the idea of like taking the lab into the ocean. There's kind of two parts to that. 
uh, one part is, you know, the fact that when we're running experiments as, as scientists or as researchers, there's only so much we can say about a process or an animal or system in a lab or in a test tube, right? Um, at the end of the day, if we're interested in behavior, if we're interested in, you know, how animals might respond to stress, we need to look at what they're doing in their natural environment. So bringing the lab into the ocean involves studying these systems in a natural place um, and trying to do that as non-invasively as possible. Um, the second element of that is, you know, are there very common methodologies that researchers use in a laboratory that could be applied to a natural environment? So, you know, is there something like microscopy? Is there something, you know, like a uh, laser-based imaging, which we've done that we can package into a system that can be applied, you know, to the deep sea. And so this is what my lab, I mean, we're, we're primarily focused in, on imaging. Um, as, as you know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, imagine what these videos might look like, but the point is, as we've, we've looked at and surveyed uh, what the state of the art is for computer vision um, and recognize a couple of kind of techniques that we can kind of reverse engineer or, or, or develop into a system that we can either deploy on a remotely operated vehicle or on an autonomous underwater vehicle. And so that laser imaging system I spoke about, the name of it is DEEP PIV. And PIV actually stands for Particle Image Velocimetry. Don't care so much about the name. If you wanna look it up, you go ahead. But the point is, is that technique, PIV, is a common technique used in engineering, um, you know, fluid mechanics, mechanical engineering labs all across the world to understand, you know, how fluid flows in and past, let's say a wind turbine or, you know, gas or combustion exchange inside of an engine. The, that technique, PIV, is so widespread as a diagnostic tool that we thought, well, you know, if it has value to measure you know, fluid movements and quantify it, can that, can we do that in an environment that's fully aqueous, right? That is water. Um, and so, so we've taken a, um, you know, a methodology that's pretty common and then applied it uh, in, in this place. And we're now doing that with 3D imaging. Um, and, you know, this is just an example of how we're doing, uh, dealing with that. And it's a challenging environment because obviously, it's wet, but it's like the pressures as well at that depth. Um, okay, we're going to move on to next to uh, what you've done to bring the uh, ocean into the lab. Uh, but first, if you've just joined us watching this, hello. Uh, this is the fourth conversation in a series of uh, National Geographic Explorer Conversations for NI Science Festival. Uh, I'm Greg Foote. I'm a science presenter and producer. Uh, this is bioengineer Dr. Kakani Katija. Um, and do go and look at the National Geographic website. Uh, the Society website has so much more about the explorers, and um, there'll be a lot more there about the non-profit National Geographic Society that supports those explorers as well and they also support cutting-edge uh, engineers and technologists like um, like like Katani and they also develop their own technology like the critter cams which you might have seen on the National Geographic channel you know these little um, these little machines essentially uh, remote mobile cameras that get close to wildlife and they can just kind of be there in the desert and film them. So um, anyway, back to Kakani though. Um, I wanna get on to kind of your former life and the transition from ice dancer and skater uh, to this <laughs> world in a second. But first, uh, let's just wrap up that tech chat about um, what you've done to use and bring the ocean into the lab. Right, so then the reverse um, that we've been more and more excited about is um, engagement. So when I, when I think about bringing the, the ocean into the lab, right, it also means um, sharing what we're doing with a much larger audience. Um, and so this is where the imaging, uh, the non-invasive observations are really important. Uh, we're starting to delve into 3D imaging so we can create models of animals so that, you know, either a researcher or just, you know, somebody in middle school might want to play with and observe and, you know, interrogate what these different structures look like. Uh, we're also, you know, working with a group to develop a virtual reality um, tools and hardware 
so that a remotely operated vehicle can also have, you know, virtual reality imaging system so that somebody could sit with a headset on and experience what it's like to be, you know, one of those vehicles uh, in the deep sea. And we've been working with a group of undergraduate students um, at Olin College, let's say, who are developing this virtual control room where you can operate the vehicle potentially remotely. Um, that's, that's very cool. Yeah, it, it's a pretty exciting project. I'm excited about it. <laughs> because not only is it inspiration, but it's also accessibility. Um, you know, I was chatting yeah. about VR a little bit with, with Jeff in my previous conversation, but that's one of the powers of using this new technology to share this science and to share a world that um, you're very privileged to be able to get into that world. You know, it's very expensive to get there and not many people will get that access. And I guess, I guess um, sharing your research is a big part of, of what you do. Absolutely. And I, I feel, I mean, I feel very fortunate and humbled to be able to work in this environment. Right. And I want a lot of other people to also be able to share in that experience. Um, so that that's a, a big focus of, of our group and what we do. Nice. Um, so I just hinted, um, you were a former ice dancer. You were a member of the U S international figure skating team. Um, mm -hmm. and I was, I was thinking about this and I was thinking lots of people think that science is, uh, I mean, fewer and fewer people think about the objectivity and the, and the, you know, the, 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 the isolation of science. We do know that science and tech uh, takes a lot of um, persistence, just like dance and figure skating, practice the same, creativity. Like there's so much creativity in science, especially in engineering. Gosh, do you feel there's any cross fertilization? Do you feel like those worlds have kind of collided or, or, or merged or dissolved in any way? All the time, all the time. Uh, I feel like, you know, when you're an athlete or, you know, you, you've worked on something so much, if you've excelled at anything, you know, you, you recognize what the effort is, like what is required, you know, to reach that level of performance. Um, also what you might have to sacrifice to get there. Um, and then also this idea of having like this, this goal, this far reaching goal that you are slowly working towards. Um, and, and so it gives you a really different perspective. Um, so, so I would argue almost, you know, almost any athlete or somebody who's had a pursuit like that um, applies those skills to everything else that they might do. Yeah, big time. Can I pick up on the, um, the effort and the sacrifice that you mentioned there and how it's kind of in all areas? Would you be willing to share kind of what's the journey been like with the academic journey, the journey into bioengineering? Um, not necessarily the sacrifices, but what have been the biggest challenges that you've had to face and, and kind of where did you, what did you dig into and how did you overcome them? Oh, where do we start? Um, I think with, for me, there, there is these definite periods of time where I identified as one thing, you know, when you, when you do something like a sport, for a really long time, you know, I was competing, I started skating at five and then I continued competing through college and then actually stopped right before starting graduate school. I think I struggled with identity, like who was I? And I actually found the transition to just academics to be really easy because I wasn't balancing academics and in, in skating anymore. And, and that's not a normal, <laughs> a normal reaction. Cause I, you know, there's lots, graduate school is really difficult. It, it's really time consuming. Um, but for me, I guess by not having that skating aspect any longer, I felt like I had so much time. I also felt, I was also really good at time management then as well. And what I have now is nowhere near time management, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's not every it's, night and every weekend training and then, you know, doing, doing the study and everything alongside, is it? Yes. It's, it's, you know, it's a very, very different perspective. And, and I actually fall back on that every once in a while where, you know, I feel overwhelmed. Like, Oh, I think I've got so much to do. I can't believe I can get all of it done. And then I step back and remember, yeah. Oh, I've dealt with a lot worse. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, that that's good. But, I, but to your question, um, I think a lot of it is, you know, developing a, a rapport or, and, and maybe this is my experience because I'm, you know, a, a woman of an underrepresented group in, in science, especially in engineering. 
where, you know, it takes a lot to convince people that, you know, your ideas have value or worth or worth. And, um, you, you know, you really have to prove yourself and your ideas before they can be accepted by, you know, the, the broader community. And while I don't think I'm there yet by no means, but like I, you know, that's been a, a process, right. Of, of convince, it's one thing to convince yourself that it's going to work. It's, it's another thing to also convince your, your community. Um, and so, you know, that, I think that's, that's a big challenge, especially, and I think in my case, that's especially true because, you know, I'm, I'm not an oceanographer, right. My background's in aerospace. Um, I'm not a biologist, right. Um, but I'm a bioengineer. And so what I've tried to do really, I, I've spent a lot of effort on is, is our fine mentors that are, you know, oceanographers or biologists who can, you know, be that link to, you know, mentor me, share with me information about what are the key questions or, you know, the, the, the problems that, you know, the, the whole, uh, community has been struggling to answer. Um, and so, so really I cannot stress enough how mentorship has, has helped me overcome these kinds of transitions. But also I think there's a real, um, there's a real benefit to come from outside the bubble, you know, to, to be, to be tackling, uh, biology, oceanography from an engineering background, from an aerospace background that allows you to see problems, solve problems in different ways. No. Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think, and that's another great reason for why we want to bring in diversity of perspectives into these problems related to, I mean, not just ocean exploration, but, but, you know, understanding our natural world in general. Um, and, and I think this is absolutely required if we want to tackle the, really the big problems that our global community is facing when it comes to our natural environment. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that kind of builds on what I was chatting uh, to Malika about, about the importance of diversity. With her, we were talking about diversity in front of the camera, behind the camera, uh, the communities that were being involved in the conversations and the solutions. Mm -hmm. And I definitely feel it's the same in science and tech as well. What would you say to anybody who's kind of watching, who who maybe could be on one path and considering a different move, or maybe like they're really excited by a, another potential path over there, or they're, you know, they're really excited about this notion of combining engineering with, with, with uh, oceanography and, and biology. And, you know, what would be your kind of top tips for, for them? Well, one, do it. <laughs> and, and two, if you don't know how to do it, uh, reach out and find someone as a mentor. Um, and I, again, I cannot stress that enough because you, you can't expect yourself, your own self to read up on a topic and know everything about it. It's not, it's not, there's not enough time, but you can reach out to somebody who might be an expert in an area you might be interested in, you know, and, and if they can't help you, they might be able to, to position you or, um, you know, share your information to someone else or give you another name for somebody you can speak to. And, and that process, right. That, that networking, that, speaking to individuals to understand their perspective, what their needs are. I mean, really that is, I cannot stress enough. Like that is really a gateway into this, this world or this, this, the way in which we're able to do these kinds of things. Yeah. Invaluable. Yeah. I hear you. Um, I guess I've got two last questions. I'm going to try to squeeze in. One was going to be what's next. Uh, you shared the Miso bot with us. This great, you know, autonomous vehicle track, you know, tracking um, a potentially an unknown species. That's super exciting. Anything else you can kind of tease us with? Yes. Um, so remember that Miso bot vehicle, the idea that we can, you know, track objects or animals for a long period of time. Really, what I want to do is get to the point where we can send vehicles out like this one and have it undergo these kinds of missions completely autonomously, right? I don't want a human in the loop per se in order, in order for us to explore the ocean. And the way in which we could do that, right, is the integration of artificial intelligence with these robotic systems. Um, and then from the imaging perspective, right, the way we can do that is by sharing data, by 
creating a community around, let's say, imaging data so that we can train algorithms to automate classification and the, the annotation of, of, you know, of imagery or video. And so this idea of, you know, a vehicle just streaming through the water and, you know, uh, animals going by, we want to automate the identification and counting of those, those animals. And we can do it, I think, with artificial intelligence and we're building a global platform for AI training data for underwater objects. So all animals that we can find in the ocean and that, that training, that data set is called FathomNet, uh, you know, fathom the depths of the ocean, but also to understand. And um, that data set uh, and that whole kind of community uh, of data is, is going to be online in 2021 this year. Wow. I was going to ask you, I was going to be like, oh, is that five years, 10 years away? You know, more and you're like, oh yeah, 2021 this year. No, it's happening this year. <laughs> Co sure. Yeah. COVID or not. Yeah. I was going to um, say, no, just it, do that it, in a global pandemic. Sure. Well, the thing is, is with the, the pandemic, I mean, gosh, it's been so difficult for so many people and, and the way, you know, I, I'm so fortunate we're still able to continue doing what we're doing. Um, and our group has really kind of pivoted. You know, we haven't been able to go to sea really since last March. I mean, we've been able to go out, you know, on day trips or something like that, but we haven't been able to go out for a week to do this kind of research. And so we've pivoted to focus on, okay, what are the big issues? Like what are the, the big limits to our progress that, you know, we, we don't normally, you know, deal with, or we think very much about. And so in our case, it was data is how do we better work with data? How do we better create workflows? How do we share it? And so we've really doubled our efforts on this FathomNet project. We've got lots of collaborators, um, Katie Croft Bell, who's also an explorer at National Geographic Society. She's at MIT Media Lab um, and a number of other institutions. So we're, we're excited that you know, by doubling down on this data um, question or need, we'll have something that, you know, the whole community will be able to use uh, next year and add to, right? We, we don't want to just provide data for just people. We want people to also augment it and interact with it and add, you know, add to it um, and also share how they use it. Um, because these AI models that they're, there's going to be a lot of effort required for us to fully explore the ocean. But then that kind of goes on what you were saying earlier about reaching out and collaborating and talking to people. Um, my last question is, what would be your top couple of tips for people watching for how they can help protect the ocean or how in their life they can they can help protect the planet um, especially in terms of what we're talking about in terms of you know the beauty the wonder the unknown life in the ocean and kind of how it's a foundation for the rest of us hmm. I have really strong opinions um, trying to figure out the best way to put this forth um, I think I think that's the, the two things one, be wary of, of single individuals that, you know, are either focused on a really quick technology solution to all of our problems. Um, because no single individual is going to be able to solve what, what we're working, like what we're dealing with. Um, and then two, don't ignore nature when we're talking about solutions for these big problems. Um, a lot of scientists have spent a lot of time working and understanding how the natural system function. And there are some very real, pretty straightforward nature-based solutions for some of the biggest problems on our planet. And so instead of focusing primarily on some new tech that's supposed to solve all of our environmental problems really vote for people who are aware of these nature-based solutions, these kind of societal movements and changes that we need to make to really, you know, achieve true sustainability. And, and, and I could talk, Greg, with you for an hour about this, but, but I, 
But for me as a technologist, right, as somebody who's also spent a lot of time working very closely with scientists and biologists that really know the systems, you know, the environment that we're working in, they, they know their stuff. And we technologists should really be focusing on, okay, what are the real problems here and how can we focus our efforts to solve those with the guidance of those individuals who have the knowledge and expertise of those systems. And too much, we, we've just, there's so much noise around, let's just ignore that knowledge and plow ahead with what we think is a solution. And it doesn't benefit as many people as, as it should. Yeah, listen to the expertise that's been uh, harder. The maths. The abs have been put in and ask, yeah. 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 I mean, we stand on the shoulders of giants if only we listen to them. Right. And that, yeah, I, I, like, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot stress that enough. Like that is a problem. That is a, a great line to end our chat. And I, I look forward to our future hour long conversation <laughs> exploring that. Um, and it's a great place to leave this final conversation as part of the National Geographic Explorer series. Thank you so much, Kakani, for your time. Um, it's been great to hear all about your work. Well, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to share it with you all. Cheers. And thank you to all of you lot watching, uh, especially if you've caught all four of these um, these events. If you haven't, make sure you go back and watch them. Uh, each one was a fascinating conversation. It's been such a pleasure. Go Do go check out the National Geographic Society website as well for more information about the explorers. There are lots of them and they all do amazing stuff. Um, that's it for me. Do enjoy the last few days of the NI Science Festival. Uh, big thanks to Chris and Sarah uh, and Stephen and Connor and the whole team at NI SciFest um, for, for running these events, for, for inviting me to be part of it, and to Claire and the whole team at National Geographic as well. Uh, it's been great to be part of this inaugural series. Um, so that's it from us. Keep safe, everyone. Keep exploring. We'll see you soon. Bye.